This is United Network News with Sonny Galt, Kalen Gipp, Kimberly Gogan, and our field messengers from around the world. Here's today's real news. A pastor in Western Cape, South Africa, has transformed the lives of many through this initiative to feed and support local children. UNN field messenger Nukululeko Sito shares more about this inspiring project. Good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Nkululego of Freedom Sitole. I'm in Cape Town, Robertson. I am a field messenger for United Network News. I'm married to Pastor Greta and uh, we have a project. This project, the way it started, it started uh, the time when we were going to the shops. We could see children from the less privileged families of uh, the orphans, some who were on drugs in front of the shops, uh, asking for food. So my heart was moved to seeing children hungry. And then uh, we thought with my wife what we were going to do. We started uh, providing for them with a small pot we could cook food in our house even if we didn't have much but we could cook what we have sometimes we make potatoes uh, with pap sometimes we make the butternut and rice and we could see that we are making a difference to our community so we continued we continued and we thought of starting a project of chickens we slaughter a chicken we cook for them now making a difference to 189 children from less privileged homes of the orphans the drug addicts what we did for drug addicts we uh, met a we formed a team uh, a dancing team uh, they come they practice dancing uh, gospel songs um, in our church we call it kingdom dance so we teach them and they practice those songs they play and uh, with no time they will see themselves forgetting to go back to drugs because they become busy and uh, we took two uh, of these children they are helping us uh, maybe two days a week some some week one day a week to come and feed chickens and clean the, the chickens and they, they are making something out of that we managed to give them something and they are making impact um, our division is to see our community making it uh, because there are a lot of people who are not working who are from the less privileged and now the thing our cry we want to, we are teaching them again to say don't rely on us giving you food. Uh, when you come for classes for dancing, uh, try by all means to maybe you buy sweets. If you don't have money to buy sweets, buy a packet of Ask from us, buy a packet of sweets. You start selling to others. Even at school, when you, those who are going at school, you sell. Taught them how to fry peanuts and package them in the, in the small packages of five rand each and they are making something out of it. We, my vision is to see this project uh, growing. Growing, one day we will move from the uh, back of the house. <laughs> uh, when God opens doors, we can even uh, have land. Um, when we had land, a bigger land, then we can start there. And we are going to make an impact to the community. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. Education is a fundamental right that empowers individuals and shapes societies. However, Egypt's education system faces significant challenges due to severe underfunding, which adversely affects the quality of learning in many schools. The Education Ministry has announced a series of reforms aimed at revitalizing the country's state schools. Challenges like inadequate funding, overcrowded classrooms, and a shortage of teachers have long troubled the education system, 
making it tough for kids to learn effectively. These issues have led to high student absenteeism as families turn to private tutoring to fill the learning gaps. Parents say their young children lose interest in school due to these conditions. One of the major challenges is the shortage of 469,000 teachers in government schools. To address this, the government plans to hire 30,000 teachers annually through a new competition plan, bypassing a hiring freeze. Although tens of thousands of applicants participated in 2022, 14,000 were rejected at the final stage, leading more than 100 to file lawsuits against the allegedly unclear and biased hiring criteria, including military academy tests. It's a new school year for students in Egypt. That means a return to overcrowded classrooms. Now they're getting even more packed. It's testing the patience of students like Mohammed at the Hadaik El Mahdi official language school. No, it is a challenge that we're very crowded in, in, the, in the classroom that it's really, um, uh, you need more uh, practice that you should focus on what the teachers are saying. I wish my son was in a class of 20 students, but how? I just wish. We suffer here with a school that doesn't have enough teachers. Where is the proper place? We only have two sections in the school. We're suffering from a lack of buildings. For now, schools like this one in Cairo will have to adjust. I'm not happy with it. I want better. I wish every student could sit comfortably so he or she could learn. Her resources are set to be tested further. Private schools, where classes are the smallest in Egypt, have increased prices. It's a move likely to push more students into state-run schools with even less space. In response to overcrowded classrooms, some holding up to 200 students, the new academic plans include reshuffling students to optimize available resources. Secondary school students will attend classes later freeing classrooms for middle school students earlier in the day, while empty facilities like examination halls will be converted into classrooms. While this strategy involves students attending multiple school facilities within proximity, it poses logistical challenges for families with children in different education stages. Also, a curriculum overhaul aims to make subjects more manageable, reducing the number from 32 to 15. Chemistry and physics will merge into an integrated sciences course and scores. Secondary foreign language and religious education will no longer affect overall grades. This approach is intended to help address the teacher deficit by reassigning existing staff. Some critics, however, view the adjustments as cost-cutting measures rather than improvements in educational quality. They argue reducing educational content is not the solution, emphasizing the need for increased investment in education. The new system impacting high school students from 2026 to 2027 onward focuses more on skill development than the number of subjects, aligning with modern international education standards to ease family burdens. Many students and tens of thousands of teachers who often supplement their low incomes with private tutoring are affected. What are these private classes? Well, they are teachers, tutors, or whatever you want to call it, really, having school kids come to them at their own home or a rent place dedicated to giving these classes. Think of it like if you were taking a private course, but for every single school subject. Now, of course, not one teacher gives all the subjects, which means that these kids often end up with two to three different teachers they see per day, each in different locations, meaning the students have to spend almost all of their day outside, either at classes or on their way to or from them. Some kids have even more classes if they are seeing more than one teacher per subject. And after all that is done, the student then has to do the homework for all the classes they take, and then also head to school the next day, rinse and repeat for the full duration of the school year and then some private classes usually start from a week to a month before actual school starts to get a head start and also get some extra money off the students. As the school year began in late September, weeks after curriculum changes were announced, some teachers sought alternative income sources by teaching new subjects or finding additional work. 
While the reduced subject load appealed to some students and parents, private tutoring centers experienced a drop in enrollment, resulting in layoffs. Egypt offers various educational systems, British International Baccalaureate, American, and National Curricula, each with different financial commitments. The Ministry of Education has increased tuition fees for private and international schools by 6 to 25 percent for the 2023 to 2024 academic year. These rising fees and the cost of necessary private lessons put a strain on household budgets. Families are forced to spend a lot on extra tutoring to ensure their children's academic success. More and more Egyptian parents are looking for personalized and flexible education for their kids. And homeschooling is becoming a great option for many families. State schools in Egypt often have large classes and the teaching is poor. Critics say they focus too much on memorization rather than understanding. Shulk decided that the system wasn't working for her daughter Rehan, who she now homeschools. I'm not going to wait for them to fix the education system. I looked at the situation and decided to focus on my daughter. And when we see the results, we can take that and share that with others. I've discovered that the learning difficulties that my daughter had weren't because of her, but because of the way she was being taught. Here, she's been completely different. Critics of homeschooling say it can encourage isolation and lacks discipline. That's acknowledged by homeschooling supporters but they maintain there are ways around the problems. And they argue children are happier and on their way to success. The financial pressure challenges families' resources and raises questions about the accessibility and affordability of education in Egypt. While the reforms look promising on paper, their success truly depends on proper implementation and student attendance. Schools in Haiti, particularly in rural areas, face significant challenges due to severe shortages of educational materials and teacher resources. UNN Field Messenger Jean highlights the impact of this issue. My name is Jean Field Messenger for United Network News. I am honored to have the opportunity to make the world aware of the situation in schools here in Haiti. The children have no materials to learn and the teachers have no tools to teach. The school is free and there is no government assistance. Teachers mostly work with no pay. Just for the love of helping the children, but their families need food to eat too. Having food at the school for the children is a priority sometimes. So they come to school and they have difficulty staying in their class because they are hungry. As you can see, we need to build a new school with activity areas and energy. There are thousands of schools around Haiti in the same situation. Thank you for listening. This is Jean, messenger for United Network News. The adoption of solar energy by homeowners is on the rise as they seek to lessen their reliance on conventional energy sources and cut down on electricity expenses. However, not everything unfolds as anticipated for some people in Texas. They find solar panel installations can lead to unexpected financial burdens, roof damage, and even scams. 
Solar companies often attract customers with promises of reduced electricity costs and environmental benefit. As the number of Texans choosing clean energy solutions grows, complaints about deceptive practices in the solar panel industry surface. Reports have emerged of companies targeting vulnerable groups, such as the elderly and unwell, persuading them to sign long-term contracts for solar panels they cannot afford. Homeowners find themselves facing months-long delays when attempting to remove solar panels for roof repairs and incurring unexpected costs. Many were assured of a tax credit to offset expenses, only to find out they were not eligible, leading to frustration over unmet promises after heavily investing. Mary Lawler says she tried nearly everything to get her father out of the contract he'd apparently signed with Houston-based solar company Sonova for these $60,000 solar panels. At the time, his children say he had liver disease, wasn't expected to live more than a few months, and was easily confused. I got my dad out of bed and took him to Wells Fargo to have a power of attorney signed so that I could take over this with Sonova. And before I could actually use the power of attorney, my dad passed. The family planned to sell his property to pay off the mountain of medical debt he'd left behind. But the solar panels, Mary said, made finding a buyer difficult. Because no one wants a $60,000 solar contract attached onto their property. We were gonna lose the house. They were gonna repossess it. The family finally turned to CBS News Texas. It's hard enough to lose a parent and then to, to see what people have done to you and your family. It's, you know, it's not right. Mary's sister, Cynthia Hampton, hoped they could at least warn others by sharing their story. They never expected to get a call. What went through you to have that taken off your shoulders? I was shoulders? completely amazed because it came up, caller ID 800 number, Sonova. You know, and I'm like, what the heck? The family says Sonova's agreed to come get the solar panels and cancel the contract, allowing them to finally move forward with settling their father's affairs. If you're a homeowner facing challenges, here are some steps to help shift the situation in your favor. Start by organizing all your documents, such as contracts, promotional promises, and financial records. Photographing any damage or discrepancies can support your case. Consulting with a lawyer experienced in solar panel law is beneficial, especially for leveraging legislation like the Deceptive Trade Practices Act. Legal avenues exist including suing for fraud or recovering misleading rebates. It's possible to recover expenses from inflated bills or repair costs. Check your loan agreements for any unfair terms. Reporting scams to the Texas Attorney General or Better Business Bureau strengthens your case and helps broader anti-fraud efforts. Collective action may result in increased consumer protection and restitution. Scammers have gotten creative over the years, and it's not uncommon to come across companies that promise free solar panel installations. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, that's because usually it is. These scammers will often use high pressure sales tactics to get you to sign on the dotted line before you even know it, and then you're locked into a contract that's gonna cost you an arm and a leg. They might promise you that the panels are free, but what they don't tell you is that you'll be paying for them through inflated electricity rates, or hidden fees. The Texans experience shows not all solar companies are reliable and getting stuck in a bad deal can be costly. Here's how to avoid being scammed when considering solar panels. One key step is to get three quotes and compare prices, helping to detect overpriced offers and encouraging questions. Knowledge is power when securing a fair deal and reputable companies will be transparent and responsive. It's also important to evaluate your home's suitability for solar panels. Ideal conditions include minimal shading and a sound roof structure. South-facing panels offer maximum electricity generation, but east and west orientations can also be effective depending on local power rates. Installers should address potential issues like roof shading before contracts are signed. 
Also, avoid contractors pressuring you into rushed decisions. There are three different ways to finance a solar project. You can either purchase it for cash, you can choose to lease, or you can qualify for a utility loan. Today, I'm going to talk about choosing to lease or the power purchase agreement option. So a power purchase agreement is essentially an agreement between yourself, the homeowner, and the utility company where you say, hey, I will let you use my roof space to have solar panels. I don't wanna own the panels, but I wanna purchase all the energy that they produce. So instead of owning the panels and owning all the energy that they produce, you just purchase the energy back from the solar company to power your home. The PPA option is great because it drastically reduces your per kilowatt hour rate that you're paying to the utility company. If you have, say, PPL, you're probably paying 16 to 18 cents per kilowatt hour. When you switch to solar, you're probably going to be paying anywhere from 8 to 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So you'll see that energy bill like essentially reduced almost in half. The only downside of a PPA is that you are going to see a yearly increase in your kilowatt hour rate. The PPA option is great for families or retirees who don't qualify for the federal income tax credit. Legal advisors recommend thorough research and checking eligibility for tax incentives independently before buying solar panels. Verify solar buyback programs with your utility provider to prevent unexpected liabilities. Keep in mind, regular maintenance may be necessary to avoid voiding warranties. Sales representatives often emphasize the federal solar tax credit benefits to potential buyers. Homeowners installing solar panels or associated technology can reclaim part of the cost through taxes. In 2024, this tax credit is set at 30%, maintained until 2032 due to the Inflation Reduction Act. Are solar panels worth it or are they a ripoff? This is a hotly debated topic and I'm going to give you my hot take. And that is that if you do it right, they'll probably be worth it. And if you do it wrong, you're probably gonna feel like you got ripped off. So in this video, let's go over all the things you need to know so you don't get ripped off. Now, one of two things is going to happen when you run the numbers and do your research. Either A, your cost of solar panels are going to be equal to or less than the cost of your electric bill. In that instance, you install the panels, or they are not going to be equal to or less than the cost of your electric bill. And in that case, you don't install the panels. Now, when you are doing your research, there are a few things that you need to know so you don't get ripped off. One is the cost per kilowatt that the company is charging you because that will determine if you are getting ripped off or not compared to the average rates. On top of that, you need to know the other are the three options to actually installing your panels. That is leasing the panels, that is financing the panels, and that is purchasing the panels outright. And next, you need to know the government incentives available. Claims that solar will entirely eliminate electricity bills, freeing you from your utility, can be unrealistic. Actual savings depend on factors like your net metering agreement, electricity usage, and grid maintenance fees. While solar panels can substantially reduce electricity use and save money, the precise impact on your bill varies. I came across a real life situation where someone fell victim to a solar panel scam. They were promised a free solar panel system with no upfront costs, and they were told that they would save thousands of dollars in doing so. Sounds like a great deal, right? But what they didn't tell him was that the system was extremely poor quality and it wouldn't even generate enough electricity to power his home. He ended up paying more in electricity bills than he ever did before the installation. And he was stuck with a system that was practically useless. With a growing number of dissatisfied customers, the pressure has increased on state authorities to act against questionable sales practices in the solar industry. While other states respond to these concerns, Texas's consumer protection measures are yet to be clarified. In the meantime, it's important for homeowners to educate themselves and be proactive in protecting their rights. UNN's Mwanda Michael updates us on a previous story about a water pump project in Namatumba District, Eastern Uganda. This initiative aims to improve access to clean water for local residents, marking a substantial step toward enhancing the community's quality of life. 
Hello, this is Mwanda Michael, UNN Field Messenger, reporting. Today, I visited the community of Irondo uh, in Namutumba district. Previously, I reported about water uh, of this borehole in this community, and I, I told you how we are coming up with a new system of tapped water. So, Surprisingly, when I visited this community, I found that the community with some, some, with some stakeholders plus the district itself, they are working on water system of improving the new technology of solar power. So that now the solar power is going to be installed and they are also setting up tanks and installing the pipes for this water to be installed in this community, whereby every home will be accessing tapped water, which is safe and clean. The pumping machine and the generator are going to be here. This is the source of water. So from here, it promotes by the generator to the base where they are going to construct the tank. Yes, so that's what I wanted to bring out your intention that we are progressing and this idea can work in every community. Now, this is how they are digging all the trenches around so that the community can have tapped water in this community of Irondo. So here we are at the site of Irondo Primary School in Namutumba district, as you can see. Oh, this is a school. So the installation and the construction has taken, has kick-started, and they, they are working tirelessly, where they will be setting up the tank. So these are pipes, which are going to be installed in the ground to connect water from the source to the tank, where it will be extra brushed. To the world is to know that what we agreed and what we proposed is going to work. So this is the the site where the tanks is going to be lifted up. So when water is pumped from the source, it will be pumped directly to this tank here. These are just foundation where they are going to raise the pillars and we put the the real tank of water up. Then the force of that gravity will be pushing water to reconnect to taps in different homes. So all home members and this town here will be accessing tap to water very soon. So this is Mwanda Michael, UNN Food Messenger reporting. Aloe vera is often referred to as nature's wonder plant and for good reason. This humble succulent has been used for centuries across cultures for its medicinal beauty and health enhancing properties. From skin rejuvenation to aiding digestion, the benefits of aloe vera are numerous and backed by both ancient wisdom and modern science. Heather Florio is the CEO of Desert Harvest, a company offering all natural aloe vera products that are scientifically researched. So today we're talking about something that you guys might know a little bit about, and that is aloe vera, but there's so many more uses for it. And here to tell us more about it is Heather. So Heather, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Sunny. Yeah, okay, so let's just dive into it. When we think of aloe vera, we think, oh, I have a sunburn, I need some aloe vera. <laughs> and I'm sure that's probably one use for it, but let's talk more about these benefits. Yes, yeah, so aloe vera um, has been you've been used for tens of thousands of years, going all the way back to Egyptian times as its first recorded use. It has antibacterial, antifungal, antimicrobial, has active enzymes in it. Aloe vera is kind of this complex panchea of, of nutrients. There's over 200 nutrients in the aloe vera plant naturally, and 75 of them are active. Oh my goodness. Okay. And so how did you come across this information? Because I know now you guys make products and you sell them. So how did you find out about this? Or was this something that you, you know, kind of discovered on your own or how did that happen? 
It happened to be by chance, actually, over 31 years ago, my <laughs> aunt had bladder disorder called interstitial cystitis, and we were looking for something that helped her. This is like a constant UTI that never goes away, debilitating levels, predominantly affects about 75% women, 25% men, um, and about 8 to 12 million men and women in the United States have this disease and at, at current, at present. And so we were looking for something that might be able to help my aunt stumbled across aloe vera, but it naturally has what's called anthraquinones in it, latex chemicals. So what you see in the health food stores and things like that are meant for short-term use as digestive aids. Um, you'll see that word a lot on there. It's not meant, it's meant to act as an irritant to the colon, a spasmatic, and so isn't safe for long-term use. So we wanted to figure out how we could make it safe for long-term use in high doses, maximize nutrient content, and we developed our patented process that we still use today in all of our products. So let's talk about some of the things that, you know, some of, some of the ailments that we might have that aloe vera might be able to help with because some people may be watching this going, oh, I wonder if this could fix this. Could, could it do this? Like, how do we know how aloe vera can help? Well, so um, it typically, you mentioned sunburns. That is yeah. the typical go-to that everybody thinks about. Let me go get my aloe vera gel um, and utilize it. But you can utilize it anywhere on the body outside of sunburns. It's going to help um, it, our, our aloe vera gel a actually won the 2023 beauty awards for Bella magazine. We didn't wow. even submit for under makeup as a moisturizer. So, um, aloe vera goes down through all the layers and helps you make your own moisture as well as being that anti-inflammatory and analgesic action that you see, um, as well as collagen synthesis that you see that's happening when you put it on a sunburn, but you could put it anywhere on the body, including the vulva. Um, for any type of vulvular irritation, anything else like that, it can be used anywhere on the body. And because it's completely natural, it's not going to be an irritant. Are there some people that, you know, might have any kind of adverse effect or reaction to this? There is a very small, small percentage of the population that's allergic to aloe vera. Most of them typically have a lot of the times latex allergies. So when I mention those anthraquinones again, they're latex chemicals um, that are naturally in the aloe vera plant. So in a lot of cases, if you have correlate potentially having a latex allergy, you might have an aloe vera allergy as well. Okay. And you mentioned this can be used to treat bigger issues, right? You mentioned your aunt. So how do you know if something that you're, you're struggling with now, if aloe vera could help with that? So we have, um, we have a variety of things that people utilize it for. Um, um, if you think about skin conditions, yeah. we were actually, um, uh, at, cleared by the um, National Eczema Association. Okay. Um, and so you can think about eczema, rosacea, acne, um, psoriasis. These are all things that have been studied with the aloe vera gel A. Now, when you take it and cut a leaf off of the plant, it is, um, you know, it's going to have this slimy, thin yellow layer underneath, and it kind of hardens on the skin. Those are those anthraquinones that I'm mentioning. So it kind of feels kind of icky when you take it directly from the plant versus using something like um, Desert Harvest aloe vera gel a that has been processed utilizing. Um, so ours is 87% concentrate. That's as concentrated as you can get without the plant itself. Um, and because we've extracted those antiquinones and we use natural preservatives to keep it fresh, because the minute you cut an aloe vera leaf off of the plant, malic acid begins to eat away at the nutrients. So within six to eight hours, all of the nutrients in an aloe vera leaf are dead. So you just have really expensive water. So if you've ever seen those leaves in the grocery store, yeah, expensive water. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> Okay, and is all of this topical or do you ingest aloe vera as well? Yeah, so like for instance, I mentioned for interstitial cystitis, in our double-blind placebo-controlled studies with interstitial cystitis patients, we have an 87.5% response rate of summer complete relief of all symptoms. And so we are currently actually undergoing FDA drug trials with that product right now at Wake Forest University. Okay. Um, and so there are, that is kind of your internal use. There has been some research, obviously not by, done by us as well, 
for things like um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. There are a variety of benefits. And sometimes now we don't make a juice, but a juice can be good, but you have to be very careful because like I said, aloe vera is 95% water. Um, mm -hmm. an aloe vera plant is. So you can get a juice and it can say 100% aloe vera <laughs> and be 100%, 95% water. So you yeah. want to be very careful about choosing a juice that is used a lot for acid reflux. And we always recommend going towards a juice um, for acid reflux, which is not something that we make. Okay. Now, you brought up a good point, and that is being able to tell what's real aloe vera that can work for you and stuff that's just marketed as aloe vera and may not do anything for you, maybe expensive water, like you said. So <laughs> I want to talk about that and how aloe vera is branded and how can you be sure that you're getting the good stuff? It is really hard um, unless, you know, you have the ability to test, um, you know, you're, you have access to a lab. Um, you're not going to know. And so you have to be able to actually trust your brand, essentially, because, mm -hmm. you know, I'd mentioned um, in 2016, Bloomberg did a study um, in which they pulled aloe vera gelés off of CVS, Walmart, Walgreens shelves, and they tested all of them. And they had no measurable levels of aloe vera in them. Instead, they used a sugar substitute called maltodextrin, which on tests can mimic aloe vera. Um, and so literally you're putting sugar water on your skin. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. And you, you would never really know, right? Because it has the same texture. It feels like what we think aloe vera would feel like. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. I think mean, probably the key marker is aloe vera is not green. So if your aloe vera <laughs> jelly is green, run. It's got some dye or something in it that's making yeah. it green. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. That That's one easy thing to look for. So Okay. All right. Well, Heather, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for all the great products you're creating, the nice natural products. Our audience loves that kind of thing. And uh, good luck. I know you're appearing in some big magazines coming up. So good luck. I hope a lot of people see it. <laughs> oh, yes. Lou Nation period underwear made out of aloe vera coming soon. Oh, excited. As Heather mentioned, Desert Harvest is just about to launch a new line of underwear for women made from a unique combination of plant-based natural fibers from aloe vera, which makes it antimicrobial, antibacterial, absorbent, and breathable. For more information on their products, visit their website at desertharvest.com. At UNN, you are the news. Get involved by joining our weekly field messenger meetings. Visit unitednetwork.earth to learn more. Remember, if it's going to be, it's up to me.